Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, September 4th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, is the stock market too big to fail? Then, if, is there, if Israel attacks Iran, according to that deal, I believe the way it reads, unless they have a codicil or they have something to it, that we have to fight with Iran against Israel. Now, what Trump thinks of the U.S.-Iran relationship and the men of head down firearms on the purpose of concealed carry. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. You come in my house, you're dead. In fact, I'll show people on air right now. And people are so scared of firearms. I mean, you come in here hey, trying to kill people, yeah. it's over. Well, you, can, we got you a bunch can do of, that here, right? You can carry it. Yeah, anything. we got a bunch of guys that are armed back I there. I think it's great. But I mean, what's the big deal? Yeah. I mean, uh, the criminal's going to have a gun anyways. I began to get into iodine a few years ago because it was helping me and my family so much get healthy and detoxify. I believe our research is conclusive. This is the best iodine out there. And I know this for a fact, nobody else has got iodine based on these pure crystals, ladies and gentlemen. For a limited time, experience the ancient power of Survival Shield X2. I believe our research is conclusive. This is the best iodine out there. Take advantage of this at InfoWarsLife.com. A humanitarian crisis of a magnitude not seen since the Second World War is happening right now across the globe. Syrian refugees streaming into Europe refuse to be put into camps and are boarding trains for Germany where the government has pledged billions of dollars in euros to support them. To cover the cost of social benefits, language courses, and refugee integration into the labor market. Germany expects 800,000 refugees this year, up from 200,000 last year. More than 4 million more wait to enter Europe from camps in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. Most of the refugees are Sunni Muslims, but yet these wealthy Sunni Muslim countries like Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain have refused to take in refugees. The unfolding humanitarian crisis in Europe, the largest since the Second World War, is a direct result of the effort by the United States and the Gulf Emirates to overthrow the Syrian government. Well, there's been a lot of controversy over the Iran deal, but now Donald Trump has told CNN that he's concerned with a portion of the agreement that appears to say that the U.S. would be required to come to Iran's defense. You know, there's something in the Iran deal that people, I don't think, really understand or know about, and nobody's able to explain it, that if somebody attacks Iran, we have to come to their defense. And I'm saying, does that include Israel? Mm. And most people say yes. They don't have an exclusion for Israel. So if, is there, if Israel attacks Iran, according to that deal, I believe the way it reads, unless they have a codicil or they have something to it, that we have to fight with Iran against Israel. Now, Trump has been an outspoken opponent of the Iran deal. Now, the language of the agreement doesn't explicitly say that the United States or the other nations are required to defend Iran if it's attacked. The agreement calls for Western nations uh, signing this deal to ensure nuclear safety as appropriate of Iran's civilian nuclear facilities. So no word on what that means, as appropriate, kind of vague. But let's talk about this Iran deal. Now, the Obama administration is selling it that it's gonna be good for the citizens of Iran and it's going to finally bring peace to the Middle East. Now, come on. First of all, Iran is one of the biggest backers of Syria and Hezbollah in, the, in that region. And of course, so a lot of people are saying that this is only going to work to the advantage of the most extremist elements like Assad, uh, ISIS, Hezbollah, and the Iraqi Shiite militias there, um, as well as you know the radical Iranian regime. Um, and obviously, a lot of people are also saying that Iran 
is most certainly going to use this newly acquired cash and bolstered economy to prop up its proxies in the region and try and assert its, its hegemony, causing more conflict and bloodshed. Now, but you know, that's not what Obama's gonna tell you. He says this is going to finally bring some peace to the Middle East, but I guess he means by obliterating it entirely. Now, this deal, what it's really good for is the military industrial complex, because in order to reassure a vital Persian Gulf ally about this Iran nuclear deal, the Pentagon has made a deal, a $1 billion arms agreement with Saudi Arabia. They're gonna be providing weapons for the Saudi war effort against the Islamic State and Yemen. So yeah, you see that immigration crisis, it's going to get exponentially worse because not only is Iran gonna be uh, bolstering itself with weapons, but so is Saudi Arabia. Now this comes at a time when the Obama administration is promising Arab allies that it's going to back them against what many Arab governments view as a rising Iran. And of course, it's a rising Iran because the Obama administration is lifting it. So they're lifting Iran and making them a threat and then saying, don't worry though, we'll give you weapons as well. Weapons for everyone. It's like watching Oprah. Now, this also comes at a time that the Middle East is descending into proxy wars, sectarian conflicts, and battles against terrorist networks. And of course, all of this is a boon for American defense contractors. So it's not, it's not peace in the Middle East. This is order out of chaos. And this is exactly what it looks like. This is what a destabilized region looks like. If you're going to bolster uh, civil war in the region, just take a look at this immigration crisis. This is what it looks like as regions destabilize. Hundreds of thousands of families are fleeing the Middle East. These are the canaries in the coal mine. They know that a major conflict is coming to the region. And of course, yes, a lot of them are looking for a better life for their families and also to take advantage of the benefits, but it's not their fault. I mean, <laughs> you have Hillary Clinton saying, yeah, we came, we saw he died. You overthrow Gaddafi and destabilize the region. And now you have people fleeing Libya. This is what happens. This is what it looks like when you flood the country with weapons and bolster proxy wars. Now the Saudi regime is largely responsible for massive civilian casualties in Yemen and elsewhere. But you know what, let's just go ahead and give them some more weapons. Meanwhile, the five wealthiest Gulf nations have so far refused to take on any of any Syrian refugees, a single Syrian refugee, in fact. More than four million Syrians have been forced to escape their never-ending civil war, but Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, and Bahrain have resettled zero refugees. They've created this crisis and they are refusing to share in the responsibility. Now, we're talking about people who pretty much for the most part have the same culture, the same religion, but they're fleeing to Europe. Now obviously it's, you know, the doors are wide open there, but the Gulf nations, check this out, the Gulf nations argue that accepting large numbers of Syrian refugees is a serious threat to the safety of its citizens because terrorists could hide themselves among civilians. Hmm, you think? So they are creating these terrorists and then they are refusing to bring any of them in their country. They're just pushing them on everybody else. Now they, of course, they're providing clothing and food and stuff there for their makeshift FEMA camps, but they're pretty much just open air prisons that these people are fleeing to. And of course, we are seeing these horrific images just in the nick of time for the establishment to push its agenda. Now. They're asking the establishment media, if these extraordinarily powerful images of a dead Syrian child washed, washed up on a beach don't change Europe's attitude to refugees, what will? Now, people are getting enraged about illegal immigrants and refugees taking advantage of welfare benefits and and I get that. I mean, the people, Germany is now spending about a billion dollars helping these people. Um, and the issue is there are tens of millions more people waiting back in the Middle East. And of course, if the word gets out uh, that the gates are open, this migrant crisis is going to be of epic proportions. So I get that. But the joke of all of this is, is that the media is putting the shame on everyone out there that you should be ashamed for not taking in refugees. But where is the shame for the policies that are causing these people to flee their countries? 
There's no shame in that. It's just pointing shame at the people who refuse to open their doors, and that will never do. Now, we're not going to see, obviously, the mainstream media reporting about all the dead children in Gaza. You know, we didn't see any of the dead children killed by drone strikes in Pakistan. Why not? Because that does not push the agenda. Now, Anthony Frieda, the artist, he wrote me regarding the media's loaded use of imagery to push uh, this agenda. And I wanted to read that letter to you. It's called The Right Dead Kid. And he says, why is it that the mainstream media will only show us dead babies whose murders they can blame on regimes that the U.S. wants to bomb, invade, or overthrow? The U.S. has been killing kids all over the world for 14 years. There's numerous alternative places where you can find these gruesome images of U.S. war crimes, but they never seem to make it to mainstream channels. Have you seen one picture of these innocent victims of the corporate press? Have you seen one image of tens of thousands of kids killed as a result of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, promoted by the controlled cable TV news? Have you seen one photo of the kids killed by U.S. aggression in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, or Somalia appear in a war-justifying mainstream newspaper? I doubt it. And then he goes on to talk about how it was a shocking photo of a girl who was a victim of a napalm bombing raid uh, in Vietnam that appeared on the front page of the New York Times. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that was the tipping point for people where they could see the true horror and immorality of war, and it helped turn public sentiment against U.S. aggression in the country. So would such a picture make its way to this powerful platform in today's media? Probably not, unless it's going to further the agenda. Now, you, you'll remember it was the New York Times that promoted the lies that took us to the war in Iraq. Publishing such emotionally charged, shocking images can be used to help end a war, but much more frequently they're used to demonize an enemy and provide pretext for a new war on humanitarian grounds. We never see the results of U.S. inflicted carnage because a major function of the war-promoting media is to remove all guilt and moral responsibility for our country's actions and affix blame and evil elsewhere. The excuse for putting these visual documents of war into the memory hole is often that these images are too provocative, yet the same media outlets enthusiastically put clips of bad guys chopping off heads into heavy rotation. The response to images like the dead Syrian boy on the beach shows that there is a real human instinct for universal compassion. As difficult as they are to look at, we need to face them head on, not, de not to desensitize us to the horrors of war, but to confront our own complicity in them. Following two propaganda-fueled days centered around fake photos supposedly proving that Russian troops were inside the Ukraine, the New York Times has issued a retraction. Buried deep on page A9, the newspaper admits the authenticity of the photos has come under scrutiny. The establishment media and the State Department pawn these photos off as evidence, despite the fact the authenticity of the photographs couldn't be independently verified. Freelance photographer Maxim Dondiuk, who worked for a Russian news magazine, told the New York Times he had taken the group photograph in Slavyansk and posted it on his Instagram account. He told the newspaper that nobody asked his permission to use the photograph. And this isn't the first time the war machine media have churned out false evidence in an effort to gear the country up for war. Last year, the BBC appeared to use stunning fakery in an effort to launch a war with Syria. This report was first released on August 29, 2013, just days before an attack on Syria seemed inevitable. The BBC claims it just so happened to be filming at a small hospital when victims of a napalm-style attack poured into that very spot. Among the medics here was a British doctor visiting for the charity Hand in Hand. I need a pause because it's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looks like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of, and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. Exactly one month later, Obama and crew were trying to pin the chemical weapons attack on Assad without success. So BBC airs the exact same clip, this time artificially dubbing the doctor's voice to suit the establishment's need for the chemical weapons tagline. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looked like serious burns, it seems like it must be some sort of camera.